The rise of cloud computing introduced all sorts of benefits for the enterprise software space. Not only could license holders access their accounts from virtually anywhere, but it also allowed the software companies to issue updates on a more regular basis. But this also made the sector a lot more complicated and created a need for more experts who could educate cloud software customers about the intricacies of the tools. Tarm Arbuthnot is one of those experts. For over a decade, he's been a Microsoft MVP and Microsoft Certified Master, and he spent a significant amount of time in the early 2010s educating the public about these products through blogging and conference talks. But then in early 2022, he realized that there was a market opportunity for a media company to cover these products. That year, he launched Empowering Cloud, an online community that produces a mixture of videos, live calls, and other educational materials centered around Microsoft's cloud technology. In my interview with Tom, we talked about the site's launch, how he finds sponsors, and why he decided to lock most of the company's content inside a community platform that requires a login. Hello, I'm Simon Owens, and this is The Business of Content, the show about how publishers create, distribute, and monetize their digital content. If you want to listen to an audio version of this show, subscribe to The Business of Content wherever you get your podcasts. And longtime listeners of this show know that it carries no advertising. The only way to support the painstaking work I do here is by becoming a paid subscriber to my newsletter. Subscribers get a half-hour introductory phone call with me. They also get to submit questions every month that I try my best to answer on this very show. Subscribe at simonowens.substack.com. That's simonowens.substack.com. Or just Google the words Simon Owens and newsletter. Okay, on to my interview with Tom. Hey, Tom, thanks for joining us. Yeah, no, thanks for having me. I'm excited to be on the show. I'm a, a, a long, long-term long listener, so uh, exciting to be on. Awesome. So uh, before we start talking about the company that you currently run, I'd love to start by just hearing about your background with Microsoft products, specifically My- Microsoft Teams products. How did you become interested uh, in this product in the first place? Yeah, so um, I, I've always worked at technology companies. So I did a business degree, but I was always in technology. Um, initially, I worked with a company who resold Cisco products, so Cisco IP phone systems. Back when it was, you know, that was a big deal, putting putting IP phones in, and and the whole industry and kind of the whole world went on this journey into enterprise instant messaging, enterprise presence, online meetings. So um, I was very early on that journey, and various products existed. So we went through a journey of Microsoft had a product called OCS, then Link, then Skype for Business. Um, the whole pandemic thing kind of brought home working to the absolute mainstream. And obviously you've got people like Zoom and WebEx and Microsoft Teams now. They're like everybody knows what that is. But 10 years ago, it was like revelatory that you could instant message a colleague. Like the, the business world is always behind the consumer world. So um, I really enjoyed being in that space where we were showing business customers of all sizes, like here's how you can work from anywhere. Here's how you can do a video call from home back, you know, sort of seven years ago was like world changing for these enterprise organizations. Now we all take it for granted, but it was quite a technology revolution. So uh, yeah, I've always consulted in that space, basically. Yeah, and when most people think of Microsoft, they think of their like their PCs, their Microsoft Word, and everything like that. But over the like the last like decade or so, they've really invested in all these kind of enterprise products like CRM and uh, and other products like that. And then Teams is one of those products, right? It's like kind of like a video call messaging product, but it's mainly used by like companies, right? Yeah, that's right. Exactly. So, so Microsoft, you know, obviously a lot of people know them from Windows and devices. They have their Office suite, and and a, a few years ago, they decided to bring that to a SaaS service, so an online service, and that's Office three six five. And so they went on this journey from products being deployed on servers, which is what I used to do, to a full on cloud service direct to customers from Microsoft. And Teams is part of that suite that does the the messaging, the collaboration, the kind of file, you know, kind of collaboration, but also meetings and content. And this movement to the cloud, and this is kind of segues into what you're doing now, it, necessi- it, it meant that they could update their products all the time with new features and stuff like that. So if you were using these products, suddenly you had to be kept abreast constantly of new updates because in the cloud, they can run those updates on a frequent basis versus if it were in your server, maybe you would get an update like what, once a year or once every few years or something like that? Yeah, that's it. You're, you're exactly right. So it kind of changed the way things work. In enterprise, uh, they like to be very orderly and work at their own pace. And with a server-based product, 
they slash the partners were deploying that for them. They would patch it when they were ready. They would change features when they were ready. In the cloud, just like we know in the consumer world, you know, you don't control when Apple changes features on your phone. You don't control when Netflix changes the UI or Amazon changes the UI. They just do it. And it's the same with enterprise cloud. It's a little bit more controlled, but essentially, you know, Microsoft or Salesforce or whoever you're working with, they're going to keep changing their product. And you as a customer need to keep up with what's going on, what's changing, how does it impact my users. You can't pause it and say, we like this version, we're going to stick with it for 12 months. You're going to get updates every single month that change functionality, that add features, and you as an organization need to keep on top of that. And this increased complexity has spawned an entire ecosystem of, what are they called, MVPs? Like these consultants who are specifically certified to, as like, we are up, we, we understand this product and we can help you navigate this all these products changes and train you and customize this product to your needs and stuff like that yeah i mean there's a whole microsoft have a whole partner network so they call them microsoft partners and there are various partners that, that specialize in different products so there's always been this ecosystem of like essentially a channel for microsoft that go out and resell the licensing and do the professional services to help customers keep up to date um deploy patch maintain the MVP program, which I'm part of, is a kind of subset of a few thousand people who are recognized by Microsoft as being like kind of going the extra mile in the community. So going and talking at events, uh, evangelizing what's going on in the market, like like knowing the products. So they, they have this program where there's like, say a couple of thousand people that are kind of awarded uh, a, a, an MVP, which is you know most valuable professional that you're doing the extra work in the community to help educate people beyond just your day job. And uh, and part of being an MVP, there's a heavy emphasis on thought leadership and, like you said, going to events, but also creating online content and stuff like that. Because it's like for some people, it's a job, right? Like there there's some kind of consultancy of of the, where they special specialize in like dynamic CRM integration and stuff like that. So is that how you ended up? You first started creating content around about Microsoft Teams. Yeah, totally. So um, Microsoft are, they're, they're very good at rewarding people who do that. Like part of MVP is it's free community content. So it's not your day job, you're kind of extra miling. Um, and there's a really good Microsoft ecosystem and community around all their products, you know, the, the, both the partners and the enterprises. And I started off by doing lots of blogging. So I've run a, my own blog for well over a decade now. Um, and it was just, I was consulting and we were working with anywhere enterprises from like a couple of thousand users to hundreds of thousands of users so you you end up learning so much doing that and i just made a habit of blogging it not particularly with any outcome in mind other than might as well write it down share ideas build my network um and like a decade later that ended up being like a million views a year on that blog for this kind of niche topic so it was like a real kind of Nice things to do for the community. Great for me personally from a brand point of view that people were engaged. Somewhere along that journey, I realized I should be doing a mailing list. So I've run a mailing list for quite a few years where people could just sign up for updates and changes. And that grew pretty well over time as well. So that kind of took me down this road. And like you said, a million views a year or whatever or however much. And a lot of that yeah. comes in through Google, right? Because you're writing on such yeah, a specialized yeah. topic that you don't have a lot of competition yeah. on some of these like very specific search terms where people are trying to figure out how to do something specific with that product and they're Googling 100%. it. And it's it, nearly, it's and nearly all Google. Um, and it's, yeah, you never know what's going to pop because you're just like, here's this odd edge case I hit where you troubleshoot this and you do this and you stand on one leg and this fixes it. And some of those will get a, you know, a few hundred hits because nobody hits that edge case, but something you'll do like, oh, everybody hits that. Um, so you'll get you know thousands of views potentially. Uh, the thing I started doing and trying to make a conscious effort to do was keep an eye on what's going on in the wider industry. And that has a broader audience, right? Everybody needs to know what everybody, but like everybody in the industry needs to know what's new, what's changed. So I kind of moved into this cadence of like at least doing a monthly update where I was like, here's what's new and changed with Microsoft and the wider ecosystem in in our space and what were the benefits to you like would those turn like maybe some s small percentage of those clients would turn into or those readers would turn into cl like paying clients to you or something like that yeah definitely i mean a lot of it's indirect so you can't necessarily measure it. i was very lucky i was number seven into the company i used to work with and we ended up about 250 people in the end and from day one they kind of got the idea that 
if you put stuff out there, deals will return and we can't exactly measure it. Like we don't need to know that this particular blog generated this lead. We just know if we're out there, people will come. And definitely lots of business came. I wasn't the only one in that company. There was seven MVPs at one point. So we had a really high percentage of MVPs relative to anybody else. But they just let us have some time to blog, to speak at events, to do whatever we thought made sense. And for sure, profile wise, like it's a weird thing is you can explain exactly how to do something on a blog and some people will just do it themselves because of that. But some people want the expert who wrote how to do it to do it for them. So you can kind of give lots of information away and still people will come to you that want to have the consultancy that knows what they're doing because the proof of doing it in the blogs. So you have this blog, you're building up this audience, you're speaking at events, your, your brand is building. How did you decide to then take that and turn it into an actual content business? Yeah, so so I got to the point where I'd been working in that consultancy for 11 years, so quite a long time. And I was kind of thinking through, with this change to cloud, there's a lot less need for consulting. So I was having the same consultative conversation with all these different enterprise customers. And it was more or less the same conversation because it's the cloud, you get what you're given. It's just how how do you make choices about how you deploy it and how you how you do it. So whereas in the server world, it was very bespoke per customer, it started to get very samey um, and also harder to keep up because the pace of the cloud. So I was like, well, what? Rather than doing indiv independent or individual consulting, can I make a content play here where I spend all my time looking at the industry, talking to vendors, talking to Microsoft? And, and that, so it came from a place of, could I make this content thing my full-time job rather than my side gig? Uh, and, and that span into what we're now doing with Empowering Cloud, which is, uh, we call it community enablement of research. And I find it hard to explain. It'd be interesting to see if you've got any kind of parallels from other people you've had on, but we are legitimately community first. So we have a whole load of content for free. There's about 150 videos on the platform from me and other community subject matter experts. That's all free to access. The mailing list is free to access. Um, then we have a kind of premium tier uplift called enablement where you can pay us and you get extra learning paths, extra research, extra content. So it's it's kind of that classic like freemium kind of journey, um, but not not the free bit is not token, almost the free bit. The model I want is we can give away 90% for free, deliver loads of value and still have content. And we're lucky because of my ties in the industry, we've got lots of vendors who are happy to sponsor that free content, obviously in exchange for the potential of eyeballs and webinars and things. Um, so, so far we're kind of 18 months in and um, yeah, we've been doing well. We've got like four and a half thousand people on the platform now kind of engaged, which is a fraction of what I get on the mailing list on LinkedIn, everything else, but it's kind of constantly growing. And more importantly, we're getting really good feedback from the community on, you know, thanks for pulling this content together. Thanks for keeping us up to date, which I really like to hear. So like, you know, most of the people I interview for this pod, for this show, um, like if they were going to create video content or something, they start publishing it to like YouTube or TikTok or something. Like when you say platform, like empowering cloud is literally a, a platform. It's like, even though there, it's free content, it's a platform that you have to have a user account and log into yep. it, correct? Yeah, totally. We went through a bit of a discovery journey. So initially, like I wanted something where we could control the experience. Um, so I looked at various learning management systems. So I looked at Kajabi, looked at Circle, looked at all these different platforms and nothing had quite the combination of things that we wanted. We wanted to control how the content was searched and indexed. We wanted to control what the experience was. And, and we knew at some point we were going to have a premium option. So we wanted a journey between free and premium. Um, and we ended up building our own LMS as well, which I think we're going to go back to a commodity product now. We can talk about that potentially. Um, but yeah, we decided I, I've got an unfair advantage in that I used to run a, a product team in my previous company as well as consulting. So I knew a developer. So we decided to roll our own platform on Microsoft Azure, which is their cloud. So we we own the website, we own the experience, we use Auth0 for the login. Um, it's not a path I would recommend to your typical content creator because it turns out you're building a product at the same time as producing content. So there's a bit of overhead there, but in terms of controlling the experience for the for the customer, the community, it's really nice because we can say, well, we want this button here. We want that video to show up there. It's really, it's really handy. And when did you build this platform? Um, so Tom Morgan, my one of the um, people who works with me, built the platform. We had 
from me quitting my job, we had six months where we just focused on kind of building the platform out to an MVP and then we launched. So it was a multi-month process to build the foundations and then we keep tweaking it as we go. And when did you quit your job? Uh, Christmas before last. So so we've been launched 18, uh, yeah. So probably we've, we've been kind of incorporated about 18 months. We've been going for a bit less than that on the platform. So July was our, just gone was our first birthday of the platform. So someone, a free user, they go and they create an account and they get access to this platform. So like, what are they getting once they get inside? Like, what are the, what's the suite of offerings for a free user, a free so, kind of so for a free user? Commun- for a free community user, we, we have um, 28 subject matter expert authors who have produced kind of, we call them briefings, 15 minute videos on particular topics. So they get to log in, see that experience and, and see the videos that sign in also gives them access to join our community calls so we do like kind of uh, like office hours type calls um and we have other bits of content so written content things like that but essentially the login lets us know who's engaged what they're engaged in so from a, from our point of view the give get is we now know oh that video blew up people want more content on that or this subject people are asking lots of questions about if we'd done youtube or we'd done like a wordpress or something i don't feel like we would have got the same level of feedback and engagement as we do because we have people sign into a platform there's obviously an opportunity cost there if we were completely ungated i reckon we'd have more net views i know that from the blog days um but i'm trying to build value in the community not just views if that makes sense so they log in they get access to kind of evergreen on-demand videos and then you have office hours calls how often uh, monthly monthly and that's like around a specific topic or it's just kind of an open air yeah, forum yeah of... we normally again free to the community we normally bring a guest in we call them fireside chats so we'll bring an sme in for 20 minute conversation and then we'll open the floor up basically mm-hmm. and do you create any non-video content uh not a lot my blogging has dropped off a lot um because of the video and that's one of the things i think i'm learning is actually there's there's value to obviously we have the, the email so i send the emails out monthly so that's text-based um, but I think I want to bring some blogging back into my cycle because it's so much faster to put that in um, and get the content out than it is with just video. What about like research reports? I saw that touted on the homepage. Yeah, sorry. So, so, so if you step up to our premium, our enablement program. Oh, okay, so this is that's research. not free content. Yeah. So the that, free content paid. is just the free content is just the on-demand videos and the monthly. Um, it, it, exactly, and the, the research we've uh, we use a Microsoft product called Power BI, which is like a data visualization product so we can do interactive reports on like these are the 11 vendors for this solution here's how to compare them that kind of thing Mm -hmm. and how do you monetize the free audience um so we have uh we have six sponsors called benefactors so they um essentially sponsor all the community elements so that's how we fund the platform costs and we have a community manager and we've just employed someone for marketing as well Um, and the give get there is they'll get brand lift because we mentioned them in the monthly update videos. We'll mention them on the mailing list. Um, but I will also do, depending on who they are, one or two webinars a year with them. So extra content about their products, about their proposition. So they have zero influence over platform content. They have zero influence over research or anything else. And part of the contract is like, you don't influence us or the community, you're supporting the community. But we're fortunate in the Microsoft space, there's lots of third party solutions to complete the story so there's lots of people that, and having worked in the space for so long i know a lot of them that they're willing to kind of invest in educating the space to you know give everybody a better experience basically so they're buy, they're buying like an annual sponsorship not yep. like it's not yeah, like, they're, yeah. It's not like they're sponsoring June, individual June to things. july so they, they they there's six big ones that sponsor the the entire year and then there's a lower tier below that as well mm-hmm. and uh like what are the sponsors are they consultants are they some kind of tech product that's built on to to microsoft teams yeah tech tech products that add on to the the solution so microsoft because there's an api right Totally. So, so in Microsoft Teams, um, if you want to do compliance call recording, like you're a bank or you have regulatory reasons, there's third parties for that. If you want to have contact center, there's third party for that. If you want to have physical phones, physical video systems, rooms, there's third parties for that. So there's quite a big third party ecosystem of products that pretty much every enterprise needs to complete their story. 
Um, obviously, a lot of our audience is that type of customer as well as the partners that resell that. So there's a really synergistic relationship there of they want to get people aware of their portfolio and their options. Um, and we feel like we're, it's, uh, when I first started, I wanted to do zero sponsorship because I thought it would kind of impact us. But multiple people were like, that's mad. Like, everybody does sponsorship. All events are sponsored. Like, everything Gartner does is sponsored. Like, like sponsored is part of the proposition of making a free platform. Um, so I've been very kind of nervous to make sure the balance is right between not just being like a sponsor shill and losing all credibility and giving value to those sponsors to make sure they get eyeballs but so far the balance seems to be really good we make sure whenever we do content with sponsors we find someone that we think is going to add value to the community so it's a good conversation not just a, an advert if that makes sense and like what is the value then like they're getting their logo somewhere on the site yep. and in the newsletter or are they is there something a little bit more explicit in terms of user acquisition for them or so or customer acquisition so we don't share we don't share any user information at all ever that's kind of one of our our fundamentals so it's it's visibility basically brand lift the mailing list is now 11,000 people so they get you know I mentioned at the start of the monthly email saying thanks to this sponsor they do this thing um, and on my monthly video updates, I'll mention one of those sponsors being like, hey, thanks to this sponsor. Um, but I will also, out of band of our community, I will do webinars with them. So they'll get to do a webinar about their product and I'll be a guest, for example, or I'll do you know, their sales kickoff or some other, some other content. A lot of them have physical in-person events where I'll speak, that kind of thing. So they get some outside access to me as well as the sponsorship. Given there's so much friction to accessing the, even the free content, how do you do user acquisition? How do people discover Empowering Cloud and sign up and everything like that? Like, how do you drive those new people to the community? Is it completely word of mouth or is it like you have a Yeah, it's, it's a great question. So I'm building off the back of the blog and the mailing list and my social is like LinkedIn in particular is quite strong for me. So I think I have 36,000 people following me on LinkedIn as well. So the growth to date has all been based off existing social blog mailing list. We're kind of at a point now where you mentioned the risk and content earlier. I think I need to put more time into blogging because that would be ungated. That would hit the SEO, which would make more people aware of us. Um, but mostly it's just being in the community, doing the events, doing the speaking, like doing the, you know, being, I'm on LinkedIn nearly every day sharing information as well. So uh, it, it's a mix of existing audience and social. And I think over the next kind of 24 months, as we have a marketing person now, we'll do more free content and SEO potentially. And you mentioned a newsletter list that has 11,000 people on it. Is that just like people who have created a free account for on... For on the site, on the platform? Uh, so, so a lot of that audience precedes uh, the Empowering Cloud stuff. So that was back when I had the blog and I built the mailing list up. That was, That's that mailing list. Mm -hmm. So you, we, you mentioned before that there's also a paid tier. How does that work? Yeah, so, so we, we, we sell that based on an organizational access. So we don't sell a per user because I feel like that's kind of conflicting with the community first approach. So that would be either Microsoft partner or a end customer that wants additional insights, access to the research, access to a, a private office hours we do for them. Um, so they would pay a fee per month to join that. And then as many people in their organization as they like can go through the, the research. We do extra learning path content for them and the office hours. So that's like they're paying like I don't know what your pricing is, but like a thousand dollars a month and that gives them unlimited usernames or something like that. Yeah, yeah, that's it. So yeah, thousand dollars a month for most organisations. Obviously, if you're crazy big, it's a conversation. But like, that's the kind of mark, um, and then they get access to that extra content, office hours, and um, learning paths. You know, like learn about this specific topic for this exam, or learn about this specific topic because you're deploying it. That kind of thing. And uh, why why charge like only a set fee versus one that's based on the number? Like I, most a lot of these products, they sell like if you have a organization of a hundred people it costs this much of a thousand people it costs this much like why just do one flat fee yeah good, good question we, uh, i really i don't want to get into the conversation about do we have five users or six and what happens if we have seven and what happens if one person only uses it once a month and the other person uses it every day i just want it to be kind of a simple flat rate model so it's like either you're in or you're not and it's not about like is if you go per user you end up in this weird conversation where people are like well does the person really need it or not we want to reach as many people as we can from that point of view so we'd rather just say look 
per organization, use it as much as you want. So they get access to uh, their own private office hours. That's just so that they can have even more exclusive access to you or whoever the whoever the expert is. Yeah, so I'll I'll, I'll do an update with them, uh, and they get on a call with with me. And the, the there's, we also have a, a guy called Kevin who does the research, and that's an opportunity for them to engage a bit more, ask questions, um, and we also like reach out to that audience a little bit stronger and go like, what what would you like to see in research? What would you like to see next? What are your questions? So they kind of get a, a preferential level of like input into what we focus on, a- access to ask questions, that kind of and thing. And what are the research reports? Like what are you specifically, what are the kinds of things you're researching? So, so that ecosystem I mentioned, we, Microsoft have a certification program. So for each of those solution areas, you're either an approved vendor or you're not. But some of those approved vendor lists, there's like 22 different contact centers, there's 16 recording vendors, there's 14 different people who produce Teams devices. So we pull a lot of information together about what their what the comparison is. Do they do this, feed and speed, check this. And it's kind of to help people. If you're a partner selling this stuff, it keeps you up to date with what all the options are. And if you're a customer buying this stuff, it helps you narrow down which are the vendors we might potentially look at to purchase. So kind of classic like product industry research. Interesting. So the the office hours and the research reports, those are the main two benefits for paying subscribers? Yeah, those are the main draws and, and the, the extra learning, like the learning path. So as opposed to a portal of 150 videos you can browse ad hoc we actually have learning paths so you could put your sales team through a sales training or your pre-sales team through a three pre-sales training that kind of thing so at twelve thousand dollars a year that's a pretty expensive product um i've you know based on talking to other um publishers and the companies that sell products that expensive it's not like the traditional conversion path of char- of char- of charging a hundred year or selling a hundred year hundred dollar a year subscription it's not the same it's not like click here to subscribe no, this is always a it's a sales it's based. always a it's always a conversation yeah and you a lot of it has been to date has been inbound because we're building the so again in the mailing list i'll mention we've now added this at the enablement tier or we've added this piece of research um but yeah it's definitely like people typically po for an annual commit it's not credit card it's not automatic it's a bit of a conversation and do you have like a salesperson who's responsible for that or like you said it is inbound so you can just kind of yeah no at the moment it's inbound so uh, i just deal with it. i have a co-founder um, james rod who was the md of the old company i used to work with as well um so there's kind of between the two of us we have that conversation with the customers and are you what are you doing you're doing some stuff in like in-person events as well right yeah i do quite a lot of in-person so again the microsoft community is quite strong so there are lots of events that either the vendors host because they want to get people to the events or the community hosts themselves so i'll do speaking at those kind of events and um that's a, a, a win-win obviously it's a great chance to give back to the community it's fun just to go to those events but again it's brand aware Awareness and it's conversations you get so much out of meeting people in person that you, you can ask for feedback online till you're blue in the face but a 20 minute conversation with a person can be like oh there's this whole other area that we could dive into or people don't understand so i think there's huge value at being at events oh, so empowering cloud is not hosting events or monetizing events it's more just about you going to, to no the no we don't we don't host or yeah we don't I, I feel like i mean there's other people that do that way better and event management and creation is stressful and hard work i'd rather just come to the event and speak than actually run the event no we're not, we're not doing it's that. interesting i was talking to someone recently he he may or may not be a upcoming guest on my podcast i can't remember off the top of my head but he i think he's he's called salesforce ben or something and i think he does something similar to you but focusing on salesforce but they do events that are kind of piggybacking off the main Salesforce event. So like Salesforce will have a huge convention and then he'll have a spinoff event that is like in the same city at the exact same, during the same convention. And then since all the Salesforce people are there, then it's easy for them to go to like. Right. Yeah, that's really cool. Yeah, Microsoft have these big, big international events as well. And very often the vendors will do dinners or breakfasts or whatever it is so yeah that def- those are the kind of things that i would typically uh, not organize but attend. do you think that there's an opportunity there for empowering cloud to have those uh, kinds of spin-off uh, events uh, i definitely like think there's an opportunity like like there's there's lots of people in our space who do a good job in that space and like i think there's a lot going on so i think maybe long term potentially or what i'd love to do i think is 
small round tables like bring together five eight ten people like that is really exciting to me because it's not difficult to organize and you get huge value out of it i think if you want to commercially make money out of an event you've got to go pretty big to make the commercials make sense so i'd, I'd rather just do round tables or breakfast potentially interesting so if you were looking at kind of like a pie graph of of your business of the sponsorships the six main sponsors versus the the paid memberships like what's the like what's gener generating the majority of your revenue right now yeah so right now it's definitely sponsorship like by quite a long way we're like that we've only been going 18 months and that was the kind of launch model so so we wanted to nail that down make sure we were giving people value the sponsors were happy now we're working on kind of that productizing of the enablement packages so um the, the plan is i i I want sponsorship to be part of the puzzle, but not the complete the complete revenue model because that way we can be picky about who the sponsors are, who the sponsors aren't, how much we want out of that, how much we kind of obviously love the sponsors, but you know, I don't want to do a hundred webinars. There's only so many you can do. So the plan is to build that enablement revenue to the point where sponsorship is maybe, you know, twenty five percent and seventy five percent is enablement. But we'll see see how that pans out. How big is your team now? Uh, so we've just brought on two more people. So we have a part-time developer um, who has a full-time gig as well. So that kind of cuts down on development costs. We have a community manager. We have someone who's just come in to look after the platform and customer success. We have someone who's doing research full-time and just uh, taking on a marketing intern. So kind of five full-time or four-day people. And you mentioned that you want to get back more into blogging. Obviously like you're creating a lot of video content and stuff like that. Like do you see uh, right now you're probably more word of mouth. Everything's inbound word of mouth. But do you think the future is, is like putting stuff more outside the platform, like a official blog or a YouTube channel or, you know, even. Yeah, totally. I think we'll, we'll, at some point we top out the like reach I have from historical reach. And I think like I'm big on content, obviously. So I, I, I envisage a blog where I start getting back up to blogging a lot more. That should SEO quite well because we're so plugged into the space and um, which generates discovery. So I think it will be a mix of like blogs outside the gate and then video content and extra community content inside the gate. And obviously Microsoft Teams is just one product in a suite of products that Microsoft has and then that there's a much larger universe of enterprise cloud products that do similar things you know i talk to a lot of media entrepreneurs for this show and some just want to stay on that one one specific niche but then also then others just say okay well i've i've created a template for this now i can just replicate it for all these different things like do you, what's your thought on you know, the future for empowering, because you didn't call it like Microsoft Teams something, something. You called it empowering no. cloud. Like, yeah, what is a... the what is the idea for expanding possibly into new products and yeah. niches? So, so the brand the brand thing is definitely conscious of like Microsoft also changed their product names about every three or four years. So if you tie to a product name and trademark wise, there's a challenge. So, but yes, we like we're, we're very focused on Microsoft Teams. Microsoft Teams is part of what Microsoft call modern work. So that's the full office experience. That's your kind of office apps, your co-pilot, all the AI stuff. So I see us starting to expand out to that, um, but very carefully because I want us to be like best in class at a thing, not wide. There's loads of like media blogs that cover all of technology or all of Microsoft or whatever it may be. I think our value to the community and to the enablement customers is we're really deep in those areas so i do see it expanding out and like you say brand wise we've got that potential and um, but i want to make sure we're doing it well not just going super wide for the sake of extra clicks so when you look ahead like two to three years what are you doing what do you what do you want to be doing then that you're not doing now um so we're still in the very much in growth so i'm spending a lot of my time on platform and team and what we're building and not just content um i think as we grow we'll cement all that stuff down and there'll be people like bringing on a platform owner is a huge step someone immediately thinking about that um i'll then be spending more time on content like similar to what i'm doing now like i like 
I like being in the space. I like doing the content. So if, if that stuff, all the platform stuff can kind of settle down and we can spend more time, I can spend more time on content. And then hopefully we'll have that kind of 90-10 model where we can give away 90% because that's value to the community and it's, it's eyeballs and awareness. And the 10% of people that want to pay for extra content kind of funds the model. Awesome. Well, Tom, those were all the questions I have for you. Where can people find you online? Yeah, so um, I'm really active on LinkedIn, Tom Arbuthnot. I'm always happy to talk to people who are doing the kind of media thing as well. That's always really interesting. Um, or if you're into Teams, if you happen to be, if you're that in the niche, then definitely there. Um, also, the, the website is empowering.cloud. So um, if you want to see what we're doing, like you might not be in the space, but just interested, you can sign up for a free account and click around and get a feel as well. Awesome. Well, this is great talking to you and thanks so much for coming on. Cool. Thanks, Simon. Appreciate it.